Welcome back to Bargaining 101. I'm William Spaniel, and this lecture is on the continuous version of the ultimatum game. I cover it in Chapter 3 of Game Theory 101, Bargaining. And you can check the video description for more information about that. So what are we doing here that's different from what we've done before? Well, we're still bargaining over some sort of surplus between two parties. In the previous version, though, we had fixed $1 increments. So when we were having Albert and Barbara bargain over that vehicle, where there was $500 of surplus, Albert could only offer Barbara divisions that ended in fixed dollar amounts, whole dollar amounts. In this time, or in this lecture, we're going to allow any fraction of a value to be split in any way. So not only can you bargain over dollars, for example, you can bargain over cents and fractions of a cent. And in fact, this is important to think about, because if we're dealing with any sort of serious business transaction, something that's in the millions and millions of dollars, big business transactions, we're essentially looking at these sorts of cases. Think about USB slots in a computer. So my Apple computer or my HP computer or what have you, they all have to purchase these USB slots to put into the computers. So they need to negotiate over how much that they're going to be buying these USB slots from the USB manufacturer. Now, because they're doing this over and over and over again, they're buying tons and tons of USB slots, it doesn't make sense to be thinking about buying each USB slot at one cent or two cents or at ten dollars and two cents or whatever, you have to be thinking about fractions of a cent because these sorts of purchases carry over. And that's exactly what we're going to be doing here. We're going to allow for fractions of a cent to cover these sorts of bargaining situations because, again, that's really important. And so if we look at this game, this is going to be slightly different from what we've seen before. Not only because we're dealing with a continuous bargaining good, but also because I am going to change the way that we look at surplus. So before, when we were looking at that situation involving the car, we had a car that Albert valued at $5,000 and a car that Barbara valued at $4,500. So remember there that there was a $500 surplus. Here we do things slightly differently. Now Albert is uh, excuse me, Albert is offering a value between 0 and 1 where that value between 0 and 1 represents the fraction of the surplus he's going to give to Barbara. So you could think of 0 being 0% 0 of the surplus and 1 being 100% of the surplus. And he can offer any value in between. So for example, if he picked 1 half and we were talking about a $500 surplus, like in that car situation, then Albert would be offering Barbara $250 of surplus and trying to keep $250 of surplus to himself. By generalizing it in this way, we're doing ourselves a favor because now we're no longer just looking at a single situation with Albert and Barbara bargaining over a vehicle. We're looking at any situation at all in which a transaction between Albert and Barbara can result in a surplus created. And notice that if Barbara rejects here, they both get a payoff of zero, which reflects the fact that they're not receiving any of the surplus because no transaction is taking place. Meanwhile, of course, if Barbara accepts, then Barbara receives her X percentage of the surplus and Albert receives the remainder of the surplus. Okay, so now we need to go ahead and try solving this game. We can think about this in two different situations with what Barbara is going to do at the bottom, depending upon two separate possible types of offers. The first type of offer we need to think about is if Albert offers Barbara some sort of strictly positive amount of the surplus. So if Albert offers some value x greater than zero, here, look at what we have highlighted. If Barbara accepts, she receives x percent, which is a value greater than zero. And if she rejects, she receives zero. So here, that means that Barbara has to accept. She definitely is going to accept any split of the surplus that gives her a strictly greater than zero value, precisely because if she rejects, she does receive a value of zero. All right, so that should be straightforward. Now, we have the same situation as before, where if Albert offers Barbara zero, essentially offering her none of the surplus, Barbara is now indifferent between accepting. She receives one, if, or rather she receives zero if she accepts, and she receives zero if she rejects. So again, we have the situation where she's indifferent. But unlike before, 
when we were looking at the ultimatum game as just the simple discrete version and then also looking for other solutions to the ultimatum game, essentially what we've covered in the past two lectures, unlike those sorts of situations, there's only going to be a single mutually optimal outcome when we are looking at the continuous bargaining game. And to see why there's only going to be a singular optimal outcome, well, notice that if Albert is offering some strictly positive value of the surplus, if x is greater than zero, Barbara has to accept that. So think about the best possible offer Albert can make to Barbara for Albert and his own perspective, for his own value. Well, if any strictly positive value for Barbara is being accepted, none of those offers can be optimal for Albert. And the reason is that he can always offer slightly less. So imagine that Albert was offering Barbara 0.1. Well, in that case, Albert receives the remainder, which is 0.9. But he could have the amount that he is offering to Barbara. So instead of offering 0.1, he could offer Barbara 0.05. Now, that 0.05 is still a value strictly greater than zero, so Barbara has to accept it. But this time around, Albert is receiving 0.95, which is better than the 0.9 that he was receiving before. But 0.95, or rather offering Barbara 0.05 and trying to keep 0.95 for himself, is not optimal either, because he could once again have that offer to Barbara. So instead of offering her 0.05, he could offer her 0.25. 025. And now he's going to receive 0.975, which is better for him than it was before. But we can repeat this logic infinitely. So any value that is strictly greater than zero, Albert could have, and that would still result in Barbara accepting, but it would receive or it would leave strictly more for Albert to keep for himself. So as a result, there is no optimal strategy where Albert offers Barbara a strictly greater than zero percentage of that surplus. Now, the other situation we have to consider is when x is equal to zero. Under those circumstances, Barbara is indifferent between accepting and rejecting, right? This is that case where we have indifference. For here, in this lecture, we're going to assume that Barbara accepts when she's indifferent. And there's there's no reason to expect otherwise, right? This is an optimal choice for Barbara. Barbara is indifferent between accepting and rejecting when Albert is offering her zero of the surplus. And so it's fine to think that Barbara might actually accept under those circumstances. And in fact, if she does accept under those circumstances, then it should be clear that Albert is going to maximize his payoff by offering exactly zero to Barbara. The reason is that if he's offering nothing to Barbara, Albert is already receiving everything, all of the surplus, and he can't possibly get any more than that. So when Barbara accepts when indifferent, when she accepts with certainty when she's indifferent, there is an optimal strategy for Albert, and that is for Albert to offer exactly zero. In the next lecture after this, we're going to see that this is the only possible mutually optimal outcome. We'll see why that's the case in a little bit in a little bit in the next lecture. It's going to be a little bit technical though. And what we're ultimately going to see, speaking game theoretically, is that this is the unique subgame perfect equilibrium of the game. There is no other equilibrium of the game. This is what our expectation of the game has to be. So just to recap here, the result that we see in the continuous version of the ultimatum game is that Albert reaps all of the benefits from bargaining. He takes all of the surplus for himself and receive, or rather he leaves none of the surplus for Barbara. And what that means, relating back to what we saw in the discrete version of the ultimatum game, where Barbara was receiving some sort of small sliver of the surplus, well, what this continuous version of the ultimatum game is showing us is that Barbara's marginal gain from back then was purely an artifact of the non-continuous bargaining space. So as soon as you make that bargaining space continuous, as soon as you flatten it out and allow for any division to be made, well, Barbara loses the small, tiny fraction of bargaining power that she did have, and it's all in Albert's hands. So this is just reinforcing the fact that if we are looking at a situation where one party has all of the proposal power, the other guy is going to be in deep trouble. And in the book, in chapter three, I look at a few applications to this, like the Hastert rule in the United States Congress, uh, legislative bargaining generally, and also a neat application with what sort of trades are possible in Monopoly. All right, that wraps up this lecture. 
I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time when we look at why the solution that I gave here is the only possible solution to the continuous version of the Ultimatum game. See you then.